Rewards of the self are about the need for competency, completion, mastery, and control. Yes. If you think about gameplay, mm -hmm. why do people like playing games? There's something about the challenge about getting to the next level, the next accomplishment, the next achievement. So if you can find ways to make that part of your experience, rewards of the tribe and rewards of the self cost zero. Zero. Mm -hmm. You're not giving anything away in terms of material value. It costs you nothing. All it costs you is good habit-forming design. What's up, Brand Builder? Stephen Hurahan here on the Brand Master Podcast. And in this episode, I'm speaking with Nir Eyal about how to build habit-forming products and brands and keep your customers coming back and spending more. Now, Nir is a best-selling author known for his expertise in the psychology of habit-forming technology. He wrote the best-selling book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, and is an active speaker and consultant on behavioral design and habit formation. And in our chat today, we speak about how brands can trigger habits and keep customers coming back, how to use rewards to keep customers engaged, and how revenue is a byproduct of something more important. So if you wanna learn from an expert in behavioral design and habit formation, and how to keep your customers coming back and spending more, then don't miss this episode of the Brand Master Podcast. Welcome to the Brand Master Podcast, a show specialized in helping branding professionals and entrepreneurs to build brands using strategy, psychology, and creative thinking. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brand Master Podcast. And I'm absolutely delighted to have on the show with me today, Mr. Nir Isle. Nir, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, now, Nir, just quickly, just a bit of a background as to how you ended up in this very interesting space. Because for me, I, I, I'm I'm everything branding. I love everything branding. Uh, you know, I'm I'm passionate about it. But at the center of that is human psychology and mm -hmm. understanding why people do what they do. I don't know why, but that's probably the most interesting part of what I do. How did you end up? in the field that you're in because when you're a boy i i don't think you you grow up and you have these specified ideas of what you're gonna end up how did you end up in in the field that you're in so it depends how far back you want to go i i would say that my fascination with uh brands and marketing actually started believe it or not when i was very young so i used to be clinically obese and uh from a uh, from a pretty young age uh and I remember, and I'm not just talking overweight, I was actually obese. My, I remember my mom taking me to the doctor and the doctor is having this chart on the wall that said, okay, here's the green zone, uh, that's normal weight. Here's the yellow zone, that's overweight. Here's you, you're in this red zone, you're obese. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember feeling for a good chunk of my life that food controlled me. And it wasn't until I actually kind of was exposed to, um, you know, uh, what do they used to call it back then? They had these shows. I remember these these television shows that educated kids on uh, on 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 how consumers behave. Right, being a smart shopper. I think they used to call it. Okay. Now we call it consumer psychology. We have fancy words for mm -mm. it. Basically, back then it was like here's here's how to be a, a smart shopper. And I remember kind of getting my first taste around how. Uh, marketers oftentimes use psychology to change human behavior. I remember I learned from a very young age about why on the box of, of cereal that I used to love, Trix was the brand I used to love growing up in the States. And it had the Trix rabbit and the Trix rabbit was always looking down. And so I don't know if it's an urban legend or if it's true, but they say that the, the, the rabbit is looking down so that when the box is on the shelf, children look up and immediately they, they uh, see the, yeah, the, the wow. rabbit looking back at them. So I remember, you know, different tricks like that and uh, mm. becoming really fascinated by how uh, how uh, companies can can influence human behavior. And then uh, when I lost the weight, I remember feeling very empowered by the fact that even though those tips and tr th th those tricks were were good, they weren't that good. And, and I think it gave me a lot of confidence uh, for what I do today in that I was able to kind of overcome uh, the, the bad aspects of consumer psychology. And what I do today is basically use consumer psychology for good, trying to help people build healthy habits rather than destructive habits. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's super fascinating because the, the, the discipline itself, consumer psychology gets a bad rap because I know, and, and by no means um, am I an expert in consumer psychology, but I do talk a lot about branding and I talk a lot 
about consumer psychology and I've done videos on consumer psychology. And in the comments, I'll have people saying that I'm trying to manipulate people by talking about this discipline. Whereas, you know, I'm talking about this discipline because it exists and it's part of what we do. When you say that you're you're now trying to use this power for good what is it what is your 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 mission are is is your mission to get this information into the hands of people so that they can make better choices on checkout or to just merely understand what's going in the market so that they're a little bit more empowered no no i want people to be a lot more empowered by first starting with the makers and so that's 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 really my audience so when i wrote hooked how to build habit forming products my first book that book is is clearly marketed towards people who, uh, who who lead brands who build consumer experiences who design user interfaces uh anyone who has a business that needs people to keep coming back and so the ethical framework that i provide is that manipulation on its own has a bad connotation, but I would argue that it's not a bad thing at all, that manipulation is a neutral term. And in fact, I'll prove it to you, we pay for the privilege of being manipulated all the time. If you go into a movie theater, you know that that is just flickering light on a screen. That's not real people having real experiences. They're actors, for God's sakes. We know mm. that, but we will pay for the privilege to have our emotions manipulated, right? And so brands very much create the experience and this isn't just uh you know hand waviness this is we, we know that the placebo effect is at the core of all marketing that we actually can make people like stuff more mm. when it has brand cachet when there is price uh, uh uh information given based on uh these criteria people will actually enjoy the experience they won't just tell you they enjoy it more they won't just pay more for it their brains are actually experiencing something different when they believe there's something unique about the product as conveyed through brand so manipulation on its own is not bad because there are two kinds of manipulation so it's very important we differentiate i would argue that ethical uh, manipulation is called persuasion persuasion fundamentally is helping mm. people do things that they themselves want to do mm -hmm. so my job is to steal the secrets of the advertising companies of the gaming companies of the social media companies i stole their secrets and tried to democratize it so that we can use the same things the same psychology that makes facebook and uh, uh tiktok and amazon and google and uh, slack and snapchat all these things that are so habit forming that are so sticky so engaging how can we steal those secrets so that we can make products like Duolingo, one of my first clients? How can we mm. make Duolingo something that gets people hooked onto learning a new language? Or Fitbod is a case study in the book, a product that gets people hooked to exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, we can use these same exact tactics for good in every conceivable industry to bring people back to help them do things they want to do, right? Nobody's getting unhealthily addicted to enterprise SaaS software, right? Mm -hmm. The, the, the mm -hmm. majority of people out there who are <laughs> building products, their problem is not that people are overusing their products or that they're manipulating anybody. They just would pray that somebody would use the product, <laughs> right? That the product is great if people People will just use it. And mm. so that's really the kind of work I do is to help people do the things that they themselves want to do, but for lack of good product design, don't do. So that's yeah. persuasion. Mm -hmm. The opposite of persuasion is coercion. And coercion is unethical. Coercion, unlike persuasion, which is helping people do things they want to do, coercion is about getting people to do things they did not want to do. That's coercion. That's the unethical side of manipulation. We would never want to do that. One, it's unethical, right? But two, it's bad for business. Because in this day and age, if you trick people into doing something, if you coerce them into doing something, not only are they not going to do business with you ever again, they're going to go on social media and tell all their friends never to do business with you either. Mm. So it's not that you can't make money with coercive uh, uh, products. You know, we call these dark patterns. You can make money, but you probably won't be in business for very long because mm. customers won't keep coming back to you if they feel like they've been tricked. So the difference between persuasion and coercion is one simple word, and that one word is regret. And so this is why I offer in much of my writing is I've talked quite a bit over the past 15 years about what I call the regret test. Now, the ultimate test of whether you are doing something ethically and using one of these psychological tactics for, to influence people, to manipulate them, are you doing it ethically, is about would the user regret having done what they just did? 
Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, they would regret it. Don't freaking do it. <laughs> it's unethical and it's bad for business. Mm -hmm. But if people said, you know what? I'm glad you manipulated me into exercising more. I'm glad you manipulated me and persuaded me into learning a new language. I'm glad that you helped me become healthier, happier, more connected, whatever the case might be. Great. We should be doing more of that. And in fact, I think it's unethical not to help persuade people to help themselves. Yeah, I love that. And 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 to be honest, you're you're um you know, because that was five minutes there and that was a lesson in and of itself. And I love because I'm very much uh, an an advocate for uh really giving people the language that they need to explain what it is that they're doing. And when you talk mm. about manipulation and then you dissect that into persuasion and coercion, then we can start to see the good and the bad side of what we're doing. And, you know, if I think about what, what I talk about from a brand strategy point of view, it's all about digging into the target audience and their challenges and their problems and mm. the solutions that you provide them to overcome their challenges and their problems. So if you can persuade people down the path that you provide to overcoming their challenges and, and problems, as you said, it's unethical not to do that. So I love how you've dissected that and given us the tools and the language to uh, separate what manipu what manipulation actually is. So, um, you know, I really yeah. like that. And, and, you know, as you said, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> we're not, we're not jumping into the toilet hiding from our partners just to use Slack. Do you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're not, uh, you know, we're, we're not trying to jump on these platforms to form, uh, habits just like that. If they help us to overcome a challenge, you know, that's that's the the, the path that we're on. So on this in, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to create um, habit forming products, again, with the, the positive persuasion and the overcoming challenges idea in mind, how can brands embed themselves into the habits of their customers? Yeah, so, so let's start with, first of all, why is it so important? So it's important because without some kind of competitive advantage, what Warren Buffett calls a moat, a competitive moat, mm -hmm. and that moat can take many different forms. Uh, the most common, you know, when you think about brands, you think about intellectual property. So that could be the brand itself, Coca-Cola, whatever the, the the brand might be, the the logo, that could be intellectual property. Of course, that's incredibly expensive, right? Coca-Cola has to spend billions of dollars to uh, burn that logo into people's brains. It's not something that the average uh, uh, upstart can 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 do cheaply. Uh, you can have a competitive moat through some kind of technological uh, innovation. Again, this is this could be through a patent, some kind of intellectual property. That way, it could be through economies of scale, but you have to have some kind of competitive advantage. If you don't have a competitive advantage, you are going to just be beat up on prices and features and price and features. And we know what happens. Eventually, your margins mm -hmm. go to zero, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have something that gives you a competitive moat. Habits are pretty much the cheapest competitive moat you can have, uh, but has huge ROI. If you think about Google, why does Google own something like 89% of the search engine market? Well, because when you Google something, it's become a verb. When you, you don't say to yourself, hmm, I wonder who makes the best search engine and then give the competition a try. This is the beauty of a habit. When you have a habit in your customer's brain, I call it the monopoly of the mind because we don't actually even give the competition a chance Right? When you Google something, you don't say, oh, I wonder if Bing might have a better search engine. And by the way, when we do head-to-head -head comparisons, right? this has been done many times, where we strip out the branding mm. and we go head-to-head, -head, Google versus Bing, the number two search engine, and you don't tell people which is which, they can't tell the two apart. It's a 50-50 preference split. Mm -hmm. And yet Google has something like 90% of the search engine market. Why? It's not a better product. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's simply that people have built a habit to go to Google with little or no conscious thought whenever they feel this internal trigger, what I, we can get into what internal triggers are, of uncertainty. They don't even give the competition a chance. So that's why it's so important to build a competitive advantage in the form of a habit. Now, the tricky part with the habit, and this is what most marketers hate to hear, is that you can't buy a habit. You can't buy a habit. You can always buy exposure, right? And I'm sure everybody in your audience knows how you do this, right? You just mm -hmm. Take your bag of money and you give it to a media company. You give it to Meta. You give it to the TV station. You give it to the billboard company. You just buy exposures. But what you're doing is you're renting eyeballs. You're renting attention. 
Mm -hmm. The only way to actually own those eyeballs, to own that attention, to keep people coming back is to build a habit. Now, unlike a, ha a, a exposure that can always be bought, you can't buy a habit. A habit has to be built into the user experience, which is why from day one, you have to figure out how to build that you th those four steps of the hook model into the user experience. And if you don't build that in, so you can use the hook model in two places. You can use it very early on before the product has seen the light of day. Or if you have a product that is not habit forming enough, you can take out the hook model and say, well, where is it missing? What parts of the hook model need work? And then you can look through this evaluative approach of these five key questions that you can look at to say, ah, okay, now I got it. Now I can diagnose the problem and hopefully come up with hypotheses to fix the product and make it more sticky. So it, could you just break down very quickly uh, the four steps of the hook model for those who haven't read your book? Sure, absolutely. So it's, uh, you know, it took me five years to write and uh, it's 250 pages, but I'll try and, <laughs> just, I'll try just, and give you the 30,000 foot approach. A, a, just a, a brief overview. Everybody's going to sure. be directed to 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 get this book later on and, and no problem, I definitely no recommend it, but, but just a quick overview. Absolutely. So the first step of the hook model is what's called an external trigger. And this, your audience will be very familiar with. It's a ping, it's a ding, it's a ring. Anything in your outside environment that tells you what to do next. It can be a billboard, it can be an average, word of mouth, anything that tells you what to do next. That's an external trigger, okay? Mm -hmm. The external trigger prompts you to action. Now, this isn't onboarding. Onboarding happens once, so that's out of scope. We're talking about repeat engagement, right? It's not mm -hmm. installing an app or a first-time experience. This is what brings people back time and time again. The next step is the action phase. And the action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward. Open an app, scroll a feed, push a play button, check a dashboard, the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward. And your goal as the UX designer, whether it's an offline product, an online product, consumer web, enterprise, doesn't matter, is to decrease that friction as much as possible in this key phase, the action phase of the hook. Other places in the hook model, you can add back that friction. We can talk about that later. The, the next step is the variable reward phase. The variable reward phase is where the user gets what they came for, but there's some bit of uncertainty around what they might find. And so in all habit-forming products, you find that there is always some bit of mystery, some kind of uncertainty whereby the user is operating either in an inherently variable situation where they desire more control or where they want more variability to enhance the experience. And we can talk all about that. But essentially what you need to remember is that every habit-forming product uses some kind of intermittent reinforcement. There's some kind of mystery, some kind of uncertainty. Uh, the reason we check the news every day, we don't want yesterday's news. The first three letters of news, N-E-W, is what's new, what we don't know. If you think about sports, why do people love watching sports? Some stupid ball bouncing up and down a pitch. Who cares? Why do we care? Because there's uncertainty. There's, there's variability. Gambling. Why do people love gambling? Because they're looking at these games of chance. Why do we like watching movies and reading books? Because we want to know what happens to at the end. Why do we scroll social media? Because we're looking for that next interesting bit of content. Mm. All of these, fundamentally, the, the engine of the hook model is always some kind of variable reward. Now, mm. the last step of the hook model and the most overlooked is called the investment phase. And this is where the biggest opportunity in the years ahead, this is where really companies are going to differentiate themselves is the investment phase is where the user puts something into the product to make it better with use. And the reason this is such a big deal is with the dawn of AI, what you're going to see in the next few years is that companies that don't adapt to each and every user and personalize the experience based on the information they are collecting from their users, if you're not doing that, your competition is going to destroy you. Every product will, will use this investment phase, just like we see companies like TikTok and Meta, the data you're giving them is enhancing the product through this algorithm they've developed to make it better and better with use. And why this is so important, if you think about it, in the history of manufacturing, customers, it took a long time for customers to influence the next generation of product, right? If you think about Henry Ford, he famously said, you can have any, model, any color of Model T as long as it's black. Right, Because back then it was very difficult for Henry Ford to retool his factory and give one customer a blue car and one customer a red car. Well, today we can definitely do that. You can have color cars in any color you want. That's progress. But today we've hypercharged that progress because when you use LinkedIn or Facebook or Google, any of these companies, they are making your product for a market size of one. 
Mm -hmm. If you logged into one of my accounts, you would think it's not that interesting because it's mm -hmm. been tailored based on my past usage. So for the first time in history, these products do not depreciate, right? Your car, your couch, your clothing, everything in the physical world depreciates with wear and tear. Habit forming products because of this investment phase, because of this concept I call stored value, they don't depreciate, they appreciate. They get better and better the more you use them. That is revolutionary. And if you don't do that, you're not going to exist in a few years because your competition is certainly going to do that. So the ultimate goal of the habit forming product, as we talked about earlier, we talked about those external triggers. Mm. When you know you have formed a customer habit is when you don't need external triggers. So when you think about, we know that 90% of the time that you check your phone, 90% 90 of the time you check your phone, it's not because of an external trigger. It's not because of a ping, ding, or a ring. Those only account mm -hmm. for 10% of the reason you check your phone. The other 90% of the time you check your phone, you check your phone because of what's called an internal trigger. And this is when you know you've actually formed a customer habit. When you don't have to send them annoying notifications. You don't have to spend money on advertising and, and constant bombardment to annoy them. People start checking the product on their own. Imagine the unbelievable economic value of getting people to use their product, use your product, not because they have to, but because they want to, when they spur themselves. And that only happens when you attach your product's use to what's called an internal trigger. An internal trigger is an uncomfortable emotional state that we seek to escape. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, anxiety. That is fundamentally what a habit-forming product does. Every time you feel that internal trigger, boom, you check a product. When you feel uncertain, you Google. When you're lonely, you Tinder. When you're uh, bored, you turn on the TV. Whatever the case might be, that relationship between feeling and action, you don't need an external trigger at all. And that's an incredibly powerful place to be. So again, this is a PhD level uh, topic, but this I've is this is absolutely. I, I have to say, this is <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating stuff to me. And um, you know, if I could, if I could allocate a, a huge chunk of my time just into the learning of 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 all of this to to because it's the understanding that gives the enlightenment. And when you get the enlightenment, you're like, ah, I, I, I get it. And yeah. you know, you, you can kind of see it everywhere, right? You, once, you, once you hear it, you can't exactly. It. It's, it's like the code of the matrix, you know, suddenly, yeah, a little you, bit, can, a little bit. suddenly you can see what's, what's going on, what, what's going on behind the curtain. Um, you, sure. you touch, you touched a little bit earlier on rewards. And I mm -hmm. think, um, you know, when it comes to customer loyalty, uh, rewards, you know, have massive potential there. What, uh, you know, bringing it down, back down a little bit away from the big SaaS uh, social media companies, more down mm -hmm. to uh, kind of grassroots uh, startups, um, rewards. How can we kind of uh, integrate those into our brand experience um, in a in a simplistic way to give yeah. our audience that hit of dopamine that that uh, that that little celebration inside to make them feel okay you know I, I can come back to to this company and do this again just on a, a very very kind of basic level what can what can smaller right. businesses do sure so every uh, variable reward has one of three types okay there's rewards of the tribe rewards of the hunt and rewards of the self now. Most businesses are very familiar with rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt are about the search for material resources, uh, money, information. And so the way most companies establish their loyalty programs are through discounts. They basically buy their customers in a way. That's not bad. It's not a bad thing per se. It's just incredibly intellectually lazy and very expensive because that comes straight out of your bottom line. When you give a discount, that is pure profit that you're giving away. Furthermore, you are habituating your customers to whatever reward you offer. So this is what I call the Bed Bath & Beyond effect. I don't know if you have it where you are, but in America, yeah. we have this company called Bed Bath <clears throat> & Beyond that is not doing very well. I think they recently went bankrupt, in fact. Oh, and wow. part of the reason I'm sure this happened is because they, as a company, were addicted, not just habituated, addicted, unhealthfully so, to giving away coupons. And you, I mean, you were an idiot basically for buying at the store without a coupon. They were constantly flooding people's mailboxes with coupons. And so what do they get? They got a bunch of cheapskates, 
right? That's the kind of customer they attracted, people who wouldn't shop there without a deal. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very dangerous because you're not making any money if you're constantly giving away discounts. Mm -hmm. And the reason this happens is because it works. And then company management says, oh, it's working. We need more, 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 more. We got to juice the quarter. They keep giving away these discounts. So that's not bad per se, because it does, it does utilize this aspect of variability. It's uncertain what the discount might be, but it's very intellectually lazy. It's been done before. Unlike rewards of the tribe, which are social rewards, it turns out that social rewards, if you think about, you know, members of your tribe are that, that we are a social species. We care very much about what other people think of us and what we think of other people, uh, that other people understand us and that we understand other people, very important to us. So if you can connect people together somehow, I'll give you a great example uh, of a product that is itself not habit forming, the, the Hallmark Keepsake Ornament Club. I'm not sure if you you have this where, where you are, but in the United States of America, Hallmark, do you know Hallmark? I know Hallmark, but I wasn't aware of the Hallmark Keepsake, what was it? Hallmark. Ornament Club. Okay, Ornament so check Club. this out. I, ha I have this is to amazing. join it. <laughs> yes, you have to join it. So talk about a product that is not used frequently, something that will never be a habit. Buying Christmas ornaments is never going to be a habit, okay? It just won't. It's not used frequently enough. But here's what they did. The geniuses at Hallmark figured out that if they attached rewards of the tribe to the Hallmark Keepsake Ornament Club, they found that they can attract hundreds of thousands of members. If you go in the middle of America in July to your average American mall, you will oftentimes see lines of people waiting outside a Hallmark store in July to buy Christmas ornaments. Why? Because it ain't about the Christmas ornaments. They're there because Margaret's going to be there and Jimmy's going to be there and Bill's going to be there. My friends are going to be there. And the joy of being in the Hallmark Keepsake Ornament Club, check this out. I know you're going to get very excited. The privilege of being in the Hallmark Keepsake Ornament Club is that you are invited to help the store unpack their latest ornaments. <laughs> right? Amazing. <laughs> Why would people do this? Because it's not about the ornaments. It's about rewards of the tribe. It's about connecting with other enthusiasts. You see this all the time with car clubs. Buying a car is not something people do habitually. But if I am with other you know, enthusiasts of that brand, well, then that's why I keep coming back. It's because of my tribe. Mm -hmm. So if you can find ways to connect people together, there are many, many examples. There are many in the book as well. That's one way is rewards of the tribe. Mm -hmm. There's also what we call rewards of the self. Rewards of the self are about the need for competency, completion, mastery, and control. Yes. If you think about gameplay, mm -hmm. why do people like playing games? You know, if you think about Candy Crush, you're not playing with other people necessarily. Angry Birds, you're, you're not winning anything in terms of material possessions. There's something about the challenge about getting to the next level, the next accomplishment, the next achievement. So if you can find ways to make that part of your experience, rewards of the tribe and rewards of the self cost zero. Zero. You're not giving anything away in terms of material value. It costs you nothing. All it costs you is good habit-forming design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and the 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 hallmark example is is absolutely awesome and look i, I can definitely uh, attest to um you know the the social group aspect of that at brandmaster academy we have a, a very active um group on facebook and you know i'm i'm very very uh, protective of that group uh, we don't advertise in that group. We don't even post our content in that group. Mm. We don't allow other people to post content in that group. That group is for the people uh, mm. to talk about whatever they want, to post, uh, you know, questions, to just have that conversation because, you know, everywhere else is full of noise. And if you right. protect that environment to give them the space to just uh, you know, talk about things that they want to talk about and connect with other people on the same level, then they're going to come back time and again. So yeah, I can, I can That's definitely right. attest to that. And it, there is a lot of reward there. And, and, and the, the mantra I want folks to remember is that monetization is a result of engagement. I'll say that again. Monetization is a result of engagement, not the other way around people, mm. particularly when it comes to e-commerce, you know, companies that I've worked with over the years on e-commerce, they are so focused on getting people to check out and they mm. have totally missed the ball on getting people to check in. Mm -hmm. That's the missing opportunity. If you can <laughs> get people 
to participate, if you can get people to consume your content, if you can get people to activate in your community, if you can get them to build some sort of habit around your product, when it is time to check out, when it is time to buy something, the result of engagement will eventually be monetization. Mm. But first, you have to get them engaged. Yeah, and, so and that's I, I, where building a habit forming product is so important. And I think when you look at the the transaction or the checkout or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it as the byproduct, when you when right. you position that as the byproduct, it allows you to turn your focus to all the other things that you can be doing, and you know, Bingo. all of those things build engagement. You know, that's right. Put, putting the 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 transaction to the side as what will eventually happen. Um, right. You know, just just as in any relationship, you know, we're all human. We all we all get that. Uh, you know, uh, we've all heard the the the. Um, you know, the idea of, you know, going up and asking to, someone to marry you, you know, the moment you meet them, you know, you, you go for a coffee, you, you, you invest, you nurture, and then, you know, the byproduct comes later on when you do all the right things. So, uh, so right. yeah, I, I, right. I really, really love that brand communications. This is, this is something that, that you talk about what strategies can, can make communication of a brand, you know, compelling rather than overwhelming because i know a lot of brands uh kind of get caught up and, and they they need to to tell everybody everything and and they can sometimes be overwhelming what what can brands yeah. do in their communication to be a little bit more subtle and compelling so to me i think when it comes to brand communication uh you want to use the paid triggers when we talked about external triggers earlier there are different types of triggers paid triggers when you have to rent someone else's audience, someone else's habit. So if you advertise on Google or if you advertise on Meta or if you advertise, wherever you pay someone to uh, rent someone else's attention, those are paid triggers. You want to use those incredibly sparsely because they're very expensive, even though psychologically that's what marketers want to do. They just want to pay someone to take care of the problem and it almost never does. Mm -hmm. The goal really should be, I think we are moving towards a world where more and more advertising dollars will be spent in direct response. That's nothing new. We all know direct response is, is, is the way to go unless you just have buckets and buckets and buckets of money where you can establish brand advertising. But that's really, you know, that's the Coca-Cola's of the world. Very, mm -hmm. very expensive to, to, uh, to create, uh, to change user perception through what's called the mere exposure effect. The mere exposure effect is why brands work because the mm -hmm. more you see that logo again and again and again and again, the more affinity you develop for it, but it's incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. If you look at the amount of money that Meta or Google or Amazon spend on advertising as a proportion of revenue, it's a drop in the bucket. It's nothing mm -hmm. like what Coca-Cola has to spend to keep their brand top of mind or Procter & Gamble brands have to spend, they have to spend a ton of money on brand advertising to keep that brand top of mind. But when was the last time you saw an ad for Google or Amazon or Meta? Sometimes you do, sometimes you do. Very, very rare. They spend mm -hmm. almost nothing. Why? Why is that? The most, think about it, the most valuable companies in the world spend proportionally the least amount of, of their revenue on advertising. Why? Mm. Well, because for the first time in history, these companies don't rely on the mere exposure effect. That's not what's convincing people to have brand affinity. The experience itself is changing customer perception. Mm -hmm. You understand how important that is? Because it's not Coke is great, Coke is great, drink more Coke. It's just use our product and you will build the habit through the product. Mm -hmm. So your my advice per your question is that everything that the customer sees before they have tried the product is just get, to get them to try the product. Mm. But as soon as they use your site, as soon as they use your product, you damn well better hook them because that is your opportunity. It is so much cheaper. And we've all heard this a million times. We've seen the statistics. It is orders of magnitude cheaper to keep someone coming back than it is to try and get a new customer. And yet we marketers, we brand builders, we will spend so much money on top of funnel and we spend almost no time and money and effort on figuring out how to make the damn product itself stickier. But mm. that is always a better ROI. Yeah. And, and you know, that's it. Like the, 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 the advertising model, as you, as you say, you know, 
when we're talking about the giant brands of the world like Coke and, you know, just paying for uh, brand exposure, you know, we're talking about different leagues here, you know, and, right. and you know, 95% of, of businesses, all of the people listening to this podcast, uh, you know, they're not playing in those, those echelons. And, you know, when you, when you listen to, uh, you know, advice or, or, or tips and, and, you know, you're you're trying to follow the Coca Cola model. Well, you know you, you're you're gonna have a hard time playing catch up there. So um, so yeah, it's it's really about keeping that attention and and when you have that attention, form those habits, nurture those relationships, give them those rewards, and keep them coming and back. And build for it more. build it into the product experience. This this mm -hmm. is again this is why it's it this is why people resist this sometimes because it may mean that your product isn't very good, <laughs> right? Like getting people to your product all, is only effective if they stay. If not, we call this a leaky bucket. And I can't tell you how I get a call from a venture capitalist or a CEO uh, it, almost in tears about once a week because they're spending so much money, people try the product and then they never come back. And that's terrible. That is mm. absolutely horrendous. You're you're throwing good money after bad. It's called what we call a leaky bucket, right? Customers come in and they all drip out. What well, so, uh, do, do you sorry, sorry to just uh, jump in there because they are, yeah. like I'm really really interested in this. When when someone like that comes to you and they they have a leaky bucket, does there tend to be the the uh, you know the same let's say two three four mm. things that pop up time and again as to as to why. That bucket is leaking. So I can't. Say, I wish I could say it's always one thing. It never is. The the one thing is that there is always something broken in their hook. Mm. I can't tell you which part of the hook. That doesn't generalize. It's based on each specific company. But one hundred percent of the time, if people aren't coming back, something is broken in the hook. So the hook is a diagnostic tool. If you ask yourself, step number one, what is the internal trigger that occurs frequently enough to bring people back? And the mm -hmm. frequency component is very, very important. A product that is not used, that doesn't make sense to use within a week's time or less, very difficult to build a habit around. So you may have to bolt on a habit forming experience like content, like community to something that is not used with sufficient frequency. So that's the first mm -hmm. and most important question. What is the internal trigger, the, that emotion that occurs with sufficient frequency to keep people coming back? That's question mm -hmm. number one. Many times when I work with companies and say, we don't understand, we can get people to try the product, they don't come back. It's because that internal trigger, either they haven't identified it, they haven't pinpointed the psychological itch. You know, that I, this happens all the time when I work with uh, very scientific based engineering type companies. And I say, what is the psychological itch here? Oh, but this is because we need to get customers to fill out their TPS reports, blah, 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 blah. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> what is the psychological itch? Fear, uncertainty, anxiety, loneliness, boredom. What's the feeling, the uncomfortable emotional state that your product is going to scratch with sufficient frequency? Oh, okay, we should think about that. Yeah, hell yeah, you should think about that because you're never going to build a habit unless you do. You're just flying mm. blind. So that's question number one. Number two, what's the external trigger that prompts the user to action? And what oftentimes happens is that when it comes to external triggers, billboards and advertisements and notifications and pings and dings and emails, we send them on our schedule, not the user's schedule, right? I'll give you a, a quick anecdote. I was on a flight recently, a, a long haul flight, and uh, I was in the aisle seat. And across from me in the aisle was a gentleman who was clearly asleep, okay? And the flight attendant comes down the aisle and she stops her cart and she looks at him and she says, sir, and he's, he's sleeping, he doesn't wake up. So she says it a little louder, she says, sir, and again, he's asleep. Everybody around starts to look like, why is she yelling at him? And he's got a pillow under his neck. He's very clearly passed out. So she says it a third time. She says, sir. And he says, what, 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 what is it? What is it? She says, sir, what would you like to drink? Now, we laugh at that story, right? That's bad customer service. We do this to our customers every day. Emails when they don't need them. Notifications when it's convenient for us. Uh, marketing messages on our schedule. Mm. And we don't consider their schedule. So the difference between an external trigger that feels like spam, and one that feels like magic is one word. And that one word is context. Did that guy want a drink? Yes, when he was thirsty, not when he was sleeping. <laughs> and awake. <laughs> and awake, right. So we need to think of when we ask, okay, how do we send effective marketing? The best thing you can do is understand what is the internal trigger that your product is addressing and closely couple the external trigger with the internal trigger. That's the kind of messaging that mm. gets a response. 
is when I feel the pain that your product can solve and you're making me aware of it, boom, and I can act right now. That's the key. So that's another question, right? Is, is there an external trigger that prompts the user to action that's closely coupled with the internal trigger? The next question, what's the simplest action done in anticipation of reward and can it be made simpler? I, many, many times, you know, talk about, you know, customers I've worked with who, have, who are not building a habit-forming product. There's just too many freaking steps, right? Customers can't figure out how to get the reward that they're looking for. Mm. Then the next step, the reward phase, is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? Many times companies mismatch the reward with the internal trigger. Uh, but if the internal trigger is loneliness, well, then the reward better connect people together. But if it's something else, let's say it's uncertainty, well, then we need to give people assurance. So it's really about looking at the consumer psychology behind why they use the product and making sure that the variable reward is not some stupid gamification tactic that almost never works, but rather what is really the customer's itch and how can we scratch that itch and yet leaving them wanting more. And then finally, the fourth step, what's the bit of work the user does to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. So if you and your team ask these five fundamental questions that I just went over, you will 100% of the time diagnose a deficiency in your product, which hopefully then you can start to correct. This is uh, this is fascinating stuff, Nir. And, and um, you know, I, I just just so so you understand, I did have a plan of this podcast to split it into, okay, I'm gonna ask some questions about hooked and then I'm gonna ask ask some questions about indestructible. But I was hooked on this conversation. <laughs> good, I, good, I, I'm glad. I, well, I, did, I didn't get a, next I time. didn't get a chance. So so I'm gonna give a bonus question to the audience because indestructible is uh is about keeping your attention as a as a, a business person as an entrepreneur and we all know and i can tell you because i've got youtube channels i've got facebook channels and i have to go to those platforms as much as i don't want to 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 do things and when i do they are absolute experts at grabbing my attention and sucking me down a dark hole and all of a sudden 15 20 minutes later i'm like what 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 just happened <laughs> so yeah. what if you could give me uh, just just one or two strategies for professionals to stay focused, to help them stay focused throughout the day when they've got all these distractions, what would be your 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 top one or two strategies to do that? All right. So because we only have a minute left, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this a little bit open ended, but I would love to come back and do another episode where we can uh, dive I would just absolutely, as as hook. absolutely love to. that. Love that. I think the biggest piece of advice I can give folks is to acknowledge that we are not powerless. We hear way too much these days about how technology is addicting all of us, how it's hijacking our brains, dopamine squirts this, and what this perpetuates is this idea of what's called learned helplessness. That when people are told and they believe, hey, there's nothing I can do, right? Technology is hijacking my brain, what do they do? Nothing. And listen, I know all their tricks, right? I know how they get you hooked. I wrote the book hooked. I know all of these, these psychological <laughs> tactics. And I will tell you they're good. They're not that good. This is not mind control, right? And so what I wanna do for folks and what I did for myself was essentially free myself, my mind from this myth that we're powerless because it really doesn't serve us. So that, that'll tee up the next episode where we can go into step-by-step step how to become indistractable. Love that. Absolutely love it. Nir, this has been an absolute pleasure. I don't think I've uh, finished the podcast episode where I immediately want to go back and, and watch it through and take notes, but this has been uh, <laughs> certainly one of those uh, those podcast episodes. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I will definitely take you up on that some some way down the line, and we'll, we'll do a follow-up on this because I've got a ton more questions and something tells me you have got a ton more answers. So thank My you so pleasure. much, Nir, and uh, we'll chat again soon. Sounds great, thanks so much. Thank you. I wanna take a second to show some appreciation. I appreciate every single one of our listeners, but I have a soft spot for listeners who share the love. A shout out to Brand G7 from Brazil. Thoroughly refreshing. If you're looking for a new take on brands, strategy, and big players releasing great nuggets of information, this is it. I find it a deep dive on branding and what it all means. And to be fair, Stephen asks the best questions. You'll find it a breath of fresh air in today's fluff content abundance. Thanks for your review, Brand G7. If you want to share the love and possibly get a shout out on the podcast, please take a couple of minutes to leave a review on your favorite platform. We really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. 
If you want to learn more brand strategy techniques to level up your skills, make sure you check out brandmasteracademy.com. There's plenty of free resources and premium content for you to download and get you going. If you'd like to join our Facebook group full of like-minded brand strategists, all learning from each other, then find us by searching for the Brand Strategy Community, where you can find exclusive content for members as well. If you enjoyed this content, please be sure to give us an honest review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listened. And make sure you tune in for the next episode of the Brand Master Podcast.